The other day I cycled 14 kilometers. And the next day, 27. And the day after that I walked 3 kilometers. None of this was particularly notable and I didn't really consider it exercise either. It's just part of living in a walkable, bikeable city. What I like to call the gym of life. I'm not the kind of person who enjoys exercising. Playing sports and going to the gym has never really interested me. Just ask my brother. Haven't we done this joke already? But that's really not that unusual, right? Because the majority of people are not gym people. Anybody who goes to the gym regularly knows never to go in the first few weeks of January because it'll be full of all the New Year's resolutioners. By March, at the latest, the gym is nearly empty again. The business model of gyms literally depends on most people not going. But exercise is important. Human beings were not meant to sit in little cubicles staring at computer screens all day, filling out useless forms and... Wait, I've done this joke before too. But anyway, being sedentary is unnatural for us and it brings with it a lot of health problems. Problems that are easily avoidable with even a small amount of daily exercise. But the reality is that a majority of people don't get enough exercise each day. A recent study by Stanford University tracked the daily activity levels of over 700,000 people across 46 countries. They found that the average person in the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand walked less than 5,000 steps per day, the lowest in the developed world. So why is that? Well, this study showed a direct correlation between walkability and the average amount of steps of the people who live there. Put simply, European cities are, on average, more walkable than cities in the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, and so the average European gets more exercise from the gym of life. But even within these countries, not all cities are equal. As you might expect, they found a huge difference between the average number of steps between different U.S. cities, which directly correlated to how walkable they are. Of course, this is not a new discovery. Multiple studies have shown that people in walkable cities walk more than people in car-dependent places, and yeah, that's kind of obvious. You're a lot more likely to walk in a place like this than a place like this. In the 2004 documentary Super Size Me, the author tries to go 30 days while eating only McDonald's food and walking as much as the average American. He quickly found out that he could not walk so little while living in New York City. All I did today was leave my apartment, walk down the stairs, and walk to the McDonald's. 1,272 steps. He completed the last part of the experiment in Houston, where it's much easier to avoid walking. I was curious to see what my step count was, so I bought one of those fancy time bracelets that tracks your, um, fitness stuff. It turns out that I'm unable to get less than about 10,000 steps in a typical day living here in Amsterdam. I'd have to go really out of my way to get less than 5,000. As you might expect, the Stanford study also showed a direct correlation between walkability and obesity in the location study. Or, to be more precise, they actually found that more walkable places correlated to reduced obesity for everyone, but some groups benefited much more than others, and in fact they called activity inequality, which is really interesting, and you can read more about it in the paper itself, which is linked in the description. Because, yeah, if you live here and are wealthy enough, in terms of both time and money, to go to the gym regularly, you can beat the average number of steps. But in walkable places, everyone benefits regardless of their gender or socioeconomic status. Now, of course, walkability is not the only reason for obesity or even the most important one. A lack of sidewalks can't fully explain why the U.S. is way the hell up here. But if you want any hope of tackling the obesity crisis, you're going to have to get people moving more often. I've lived and worked in a lot of different cities, and that's an understatement. And I've commuted in many different ways. At one point in my life, I decided that I didn't want to end up as another lazy, miserable suburbanite in an SUV, so I started riding my bike to work, and I noticed an immediate improvement in my level of energy. 
It was incredible. Within only a few weeks, I had lost weight, I had more energy, and I felt significantly less stressed at the end of the day. My mood after a cycling commute was much better too. Well, unless it was one of those mornings where I was run off the road by some lazy, miserable suburbanite in an SUV. Commuting by car in traffic is pretty miserable. Yeah, you get to sit in your climate-controlled cage, but you can't do anything productive, and it just feels like wasted time. So, I wasn't really surprised to see that surveys taken during COVID found that most people who walk or cycle to work said they missed their commutes, while almost nobody who drives to work said this. Because walking or cycling to work actually makes you feel good, while driving doesn't. People need approximately 30 minutes of moderate physical activity every day, and that can be achieved by cycling or a brisk walk. But since this activity is required anyway to maintain a base level of health, there's an argument to be made that the first 30 minutes of, say, your cycling commute are free. It's time you'd have to spend exercising anyway, and by doing it during your commute, you're saving that time by multitasking. So if you spend 40 minutes commuting by bicycle each day, that means you effectively only spend 10 minutes a day exclusively on your commute. A car commute does not provide this benefit. You're not getting any exercise, so it's just purely time wasted commuting. You can't even catch up on work or check your email like you can on a train. Of course, these benefits aren't available to you if your city is built wrong. You can't walk to work if it's too far away and if there's no rapid transit available to help you get there. And you can't cycle anywhere if it's not safe to do so. You can, of course, offset this by purposefully getting some exercise, by going to the gym or going for a run each morning. But it's too easy to skip this. It's too easy to decide one day that you're not in the mood or you don't have enough time. There are a lot of mornings where I don't want to exercise. Mornings when I'm tired and worn out, the weather sucks and I just want to get to where I need to go. On these mornings, I hate the walkable city because it forces me to go out into the miserable cold and walk or cycle to my destination. But what inevitably happens is that a few minutes in, I start feeling better. And by the time I get to where I'm going, I feel great. That miserable feeling that I had in the morning is gone. What's most important though, is that once you get over that initial feeling of laziness, you've now got the energy and motivation to do more. This effect may be part of the reason why a recent Ipsos survey found that people in the Netherlands exercise more than any other nation on earth. Because when you walk or cycle regularly to do everyday activities like shopping, visiting friends, going to appointments and buying groceries, you don't get sucked into that black hole of inactivity. But this is only possible if your city is designed for it. Incidentally, I love how in this study, the Netherlands had the absolute lowest number of people who reported cycling as a sport they do in a normal week. Because the Dutch do not consider this to be a sport. Only this. They even have different names for both kinds of cyclists. Personally, I am a feetser, and I have no interest in being a wheel runner. It feels too much like exercising to me. I'm happy with the gym of life. But regardless of what type you are, cycling is a great low-impact aerobic activity that could benefit almost everyone, and making it part of your daily routine can bring immediate health benefits. A 2010 study found that the benefits of cycling far outweighed the risks from things like inhaling pollution from cars or being injured or killed by cars. But this study was focused on the Netherlands where cycling is extremely safe. Car-centric cities that are designed wrong are robbing their citizens of this easy, low-cost opportunity to improve their health. After my dad had knee surgery, he found the very best activity for him was cycling. Of course, he needed to get a stationary bike because he lived somewhere car-dependent. In the Netherlands, he would be able to cycle regularly to do everyday errands and activities like most seniors do here. And it's possible that with all that daily cycling, he might never have needed that knee surgery in the first place. People really underestimate how much a small amount of daily exercise contributes to a better level of physical and mental health. And that's what walkable and bikeable cities provide. 
When neighborhoods are mixed use with most of your daily needs within walking distance, you're more likely to take that walk. Your kids are more likely to walk or cycle to school. And elderly people are much more likely to get the daily exercise they need to stay healthy as they age. And most importantly, everyone is more likely to get that base amount of daily exercise that brings the biggest gain. Getting out of that pit of laziness that sucks you in, physically and mentally, so you're better prepared to deal with whatever life throws at you. I've been all around the world and I firmly believe that walkable places are fundamentally better than car-centric places. They're just better places to be in and they come with a multitude of benefits for people's health, well-being, the environment, city finances, and society as a whole. I love walkable cities, especially when they're nearly car-free, so I've started a series on Nebula about some of the best walkable and low-car places in the world. Nebula is the Streamy Award-nominated streaming service created by and for educational creators like me. You'll find all of the videos from YouTube, but also bonus content, extended editions, experimental videos, and podcasts, all completely ad-free. For example, this ad isn't in the Nebula version of this video. I signed up to Nebula ages ago to watch creators like City Beautiful, Legal Eagle, Practical Engineering, and Wendover Productions. I've really enjoyed Nebula, which is why I wanted my content on there too. By signing up at this link right here, you'll be supporting this channel as well as all the other independent creators you watch on Nebula in the future. I'd also like to thank my supporters on Patreon who pay me to brag about how much exercise I accidentally get. If you'd like your name in this list of supporters, find out more at patreon.com slash notjustbikes.